Hello, transport professionals and leaders, leaders of transport professionals. This is Transform Transforming Transportation, the 21st edition, and the second one that is fully hybrid. So if you're online, I know you've already done this, say hello to your fellow online attendees and your moderator who will be making sure that you are part of the discussions and the conversation. If you're in the room in the Preston Auditorium, you literally say hello to the nearest people to you. I will wait. <laughs> well, that didn't take long. Very efficient. I appreciate that. Our conversations today will be had in this room using that microphone right there in the center of the room towards the front, but in the aisle. Get used to it. Do not feel shy about standing behind that microphone when you have something to say, because that is how I know that you are also part of the conversation. Hashtag TTDC24 for our global audience who are joining us online is the way that you too can be part of the conversation. Our opening segments on day one and day two will be on World Bank Live. So... <coughs> We could not be here without two very special sponsors. Our lead sponsor is FedEx, break into organic applause. Yeah. Our development partner, the FIA Foundation, more organic applause. You may notice there is not a program in sight almost no paper in here because we are sustainable. But wherever you see that QR scan that's close to any of our transforming transportation uh, branding, that will take you to our online agenda. If you've already got the app on your phone, congratulations, you're a pioneer. And you will know then who will be doing the opening address. Transforming Transportation is brought to you by the World Bank and the World Resources Institute. So your opening remarks will be delivered by Guangzhou Chen, Vice President of Infrastructure for the World Bank, and also Ani Dasgupta, President and Chief Executive Officer of the World Resources Institute in that order. Welcome, gentlemen, to do the welcomes. Thank you. Uh, fan, uh, thank you, uh, Fanny, and good morning. Uh, welcome, welcome to uh, um, trans Transforming Transportation 2024, the 21st edition of this uh, forum. Uh, Ani and I were just chatting. Um, uh, you know, this we when we started some 21 years ago, we didn't expect this would last 21 years. But this is, a, you know, it was a a fairly moderate transport symposium at that time has really becoming an international forum uh, by the participation and also the high level uh, attention. You might also notice that uh, during the COVID in the past, this forum was connected in January with TRB because we thought at that time, you know, bringing people to come to Washington, uh, the linking with TRB, we may not get the attendance. Well, since, uh, since COVID actually gave us a reason to actually think about planning this uh, separate from TRB, but it turned out that we still have a really good uh, attendance and also great participation. So thank you to all of you uh, for joining. We find ourselves uh, in a pivotal moment where the decision we make today uh, will have a lasting impact on the environment and gener for generations to come. The urgency to reduce uh, greenhouse uh, gas emission, especially within the transport sector, call for a broad innovation, transformative policies, and onboarding um, uh, actions. In this context, it's paramount that we also underscore the urgent need for financing sustainable uh, solutions. We all know working in this sector, uh, the tremendous gap uh, obstacle in the, in the sector, particularly in the developing world. 
As of today, we still have 1 billion people that live more than two kilometers away from all way the road. And one in six women globally do not look for jobs out of fear of harassment in public transportation uh, systems. World crashes still claim 1.35 million uh, people uh, in the world, and 90% of that is in developing countries. Now, solving these challenges is possible, but it will require unprecedented investments and financings. While I'm talking about financing here, because that's the theme of um, TT 2024, of course, I'm not saying that this is the uh, only solution. We always say financing has to be supported with sound policy, regulation, knowledge, partnership, and all those. But that being said, the theme of the uh, TT 2024 is about mobilizing finance for climate actions. Country by countries and city by cities, the World Bank's approximate $40 billion of transport uh, portfolio investments uh, throughout the world is contributing to these uh, uh, engagements and uh, really uh, for aiming for well, in a new mission for the more livable uh, planet. Just a, a couple of milestones in 2023, the year we just completed, we have a, a number of achievements uh, through the World Bank engagements. In Quito, Ecuador, a new, uh, brand new metro is providing a clean, efficient mobility for over 400 uh, passengers a day. And we are proud to be a partner in that uh, engagement. In Dhaka, Senegal, we're also launching Africa's first ever all-electric uh, bus rapid transit system, for which the World Bank Group, I want to emphasize, was engaged in these uh, 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 adventures. In the, <clears throat> in the South Pacific, we also work with six uh, small island countries uh, for major road upgrading uh, and port and airport infrastructure <clears throat> uh, in those uh, small islands. And then in the, in the global facility uh, for decarbonizing transport, we're also very really happy to welcome Spain as our new partner uh, and energize this work to reduce transport emission in low and middle income countries. Despite all these efforts, the financing need for sustainable transport is beyond what government and MDB altogether can provide. We must mobilize capital at a greater scale, and that's at the core of the World Bank's evolution roadmap. Private sector investment is necessary to truly meet the outside need, uh, but also to bring solutions and innovations uh, to the challenge we face. The World Bank's uh, evolution roadmap has been uh, uh, under discussion, and uh, uh, the various initiative has really called for one of the focus is on mobilizing uh, private financing especially in a way to leverage using our financing to provide a catalytic role to leverage more commercial and private financing in all the development space. To illustrate how this work in practice, consider the new uh, bus rapid transit system in Dhaka, Senegal. As I say, this is the first all electric uh, bus system in the African continent. But I think what's most interesting and for us most uh, important uh, uh, way of looking at this engagement is how we can all work together. This program brings together um, various partners from within the World Bank, it, from the World Bank, but also IFC and MEGA, but we also partner with um, other different partners like European Investment Bank, and of course, the government, Senegal, and private sectors. The World Bank, through either provided financing for the infrastructure, and then IFC provide uh, advisory service to the, uh, advise the government on the PPP structure of this uh, 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 infrastructure uh, development. And MEGA also provided a guarantee that mobilized Meridian, which is a big uh, asset management company, to uh, fund to provide financing for the uh, fleet. So it, the impact of this uh, project demonstrates what is, what is possible for a World Bank group approach. But of course, we want to recognize that this is just the beginning of the project and the work is still ahead of us. The World Bank is working hard um, uh, to enable investment like this. And just a few weeks ago, uh, uh, President uh, Ajay Banka announced that a unified uh, guarantee platform of the World Bank, combining all the guarantee instruments from the bank, IFC and MEGA, and providing a one-stop shop to fit, really to facilitate this kind of investment uh, moving forward. Another example I was also mentioned is the Quito Metro which began operating this year, I mentioned already. This is a groundbreaking uh, uh, for several reasons, including scale, climate benefit, 
and socioeconomic benefits. Um, this is an investment that uh, includes several MDBs uh, ourselves, but also uh, inter-American development banks. And this is a program that requires over $2 billion. So how to mobilize financing is a key uh, factor in this engagement. One of the key partners that we help make it a, a metro a reality is, uh, I mentioned, IADB. And I want to personally thank Ms. Anna Maria uh, Ibanez, uh, 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 Vice President for Sector and Knowledge at IADB, who is here with us today. And also the Mayor um, uh, Pablo uh, Muniz uh, confirmed it. I, I think he will be connected online. And uh, we are looking forward to continue the partner with you. With all of us here, we can certainly find more ways to help to step up for this kind of example that we, I, I just mentioned. And I hope the following, the following days, uh, two days, will be uh, a really engaging discussion and really fruitful uh, a partnership that we can uh, uh, join together. And I'm personally also looking forward to hearing from uh, Crystal Asich, um, a, a singer, a songwriter, a champion for disability rights and for um, her uh, trailblazing uh, uh, effort in the Kenyan um, uh, government and uh, Senate, and then we'll hear more from her. Uh, we have two sessions dedicated to learning from the experience from a diverse set of uh, transport ministers. And again, uh, we'll, I think that will be the next session. Finally, as I mentioned earlier, uh, transporting transportation would not be what it is today without a great partnership uh, with the um, um, with the um, uh, WI uh, and uh, recent uh, uh, Ross uh, uh, Center. And I'm really happy to see um, Annie, my partner, uh, in this engagement um, here today. So let me stop here and I'll pass on to, to Annie. And thank you very much for your participation. <laughs> Wow. Good morning. Well, that's my only task, is to welcome you all on behalf of WRI to TT24. And, um, and to everyone, I think Femi said, everyone who's connected online, warm welcome to this year's uh, TIA Transforming Transportation. As, as Femi said and Guang said, this is our third decade um, of doing this together with the World Bank. And I just want to say, this is only third, third because only because of all of you have participated and contributed to make this the premier forum for discussing trans intersectional transportation, development, and climate. So thank you for being with us. And the funny thing is actually there are people in the room who was there in the first TT. So thank you for being with us uh, all this time. I just want to say it's, it seems it's an absolute pleasure for me uh, to uh, host this um, jointly and have this event with Guang. And I see Jose Luis here, who was a partner in crime before that. So I feel, you know, sometimes it feels like I've never left, but it is great to be back here. And I'm very excited, actually, this year that our focus is on finance. I personally strongly believe this will be one of our bigger barriers uh, to cross and that we are doing this with the World Bank and World Bank Group, as Guang uh, correctly pointed out, and this is a great opportunity. <clears throat> I want to share with you that I think last year was a very important year, positively, for our business of transportation. Um, and I think we have a big task in front of us uh, for the next two days. I spent two weeks in, um, in Dubai in December for COP. A lot of you I see in this room were there. And I just want to point out that the COP this year happened in the middle of a uh, pretty um, tricky global environment. It happened in UAE, a big oil-producing country. People were already skeptical. That, will they do anything useful? It was run by um, the head of ADNOC, their oil company. Again, people were more skeptical. Would anything good happen there? It was happening at a time. There are two wars going on in the world that seem no end. There still, we don't see any end. The overall confidence of the world in um, multilateral processes were at a low. In spite of all these, in spite of all these, the outcome of COP actually was more positive than any one of us expected. Anyone with a lot of skeptical people, there, some of you are right here, all even the most skeptical people that, that actually the COP outcome was more positive than we expected. It wasn't perfect, but it was more positive. 
The most positive thing, the many positive thing, is the 196 countries for the first time actually said we need to get away systematically from fossil fuel. For the first time, it might seem obvious to all of you, but it's the first time that language was used in that, and it matters actually. And it matters because transport is 23% of that fossil fuel. So all of us, our responsibility now is to help countries to figure out how do we use the transport mechanism to actually, um, actually make that commitment to a reality. Two other things happened that are actually very interesting. The world also committed to triple renewable, but double efficiency. Transportation actually has a huge role to play to get to the doubling efficiency goal. And the third thing that happened um, is that the world, for the first time, committed that the cities or decarbonizing cities is a critical part of decarbonizing the world, that it'll be part of NDCs for the first time. 130 plus countries actually signed the declaration, but it became part of the ultimate agreement called UAE consensus. I'm just saying this because that this, these things, we as a community have been complaining for a long time that the global processes don't recognize transportation. Correctly so, I think we were complaining correctly. But now there are things in place that actually gives us an opportunity to push this forward. And the last thing I'm gonna say, just before COP, United Nations published a report called the Global Stock Take, which was the first time there was an evaluation after uh, uh, Paris. Uh, where are we doing? Uh, how the world is doing? Obviously, it said we're not doing very well, but it said two other very important things, that we need to take a systems approach towards the outcome. We won't be able to solve this by sector by sector and talked about how transportation needs to be a systematic approach, not only of decarbonizing, but actually to getting modal shifts, getting public transport, walking, biking, and electrification at the same time. Mm -hmm. These are all things we've been saying for a while, but now 196 countries seem to embrace it. But not only global things are happening, actually things on the ground across the world are taking place that are very innovative. You heard from Guang, terrific example just now. I was in India just a week back, two weeks. We have a team there and a lot of um, actually the World Bank colleagues here. I just met with Olivia, who works very closely together. India last year uh, collectively, four cities collectively procured 5,000 electric buses that when one procurement reduced the operating cost of electric buses by 60%. This year, they're committing to buy 800,000 electric buses. 800,000 buses, not electric, would be a miracle in India. There are 300,000 buses short overall. So this leapfrogging of not only providing public transport, but electrifying at the same time is the kind of momentum, kind of change we need. So we need to see how this happens everywhere. So this is just one example. These kind of things are happening. So the question is, over three decades now, 20, 21st year, one thing we have done here, most importantly, is build a community of practitioners. All of you, a lot of you know each other. I hope all of you get to know each other by the end of the two days. We actually have a huge opportunity and a task in front of us. And I just want to outline for you my view of what this TT, what success of this TT might look like. The first success would be all of us helping countries actually meet the commitments they made in, um, in um, Dubai, in Belém, not this year, the next year, all the countries will come with the new commitment, new NDCs is called, to see how the transportation NDC, which has been really difficult to get to, uh, actually part of the solution, part of the system change the world needs, part of the commitments they've made. Only 92 countries today, actually of 196, actually have anything to do with transport in their commitment. And very few, actually, even the 92 are very detailed. So this is our task. To do a lot of ministers here in these two days, actually build partnership with them to see how we can actually get to the outcome they have committed to in a technical, feasible manner. The second is finance. You know, there's only $1.3 trillion in climate finance today, if you add up everything, um, which people estimate, and you hear from speakers in the next two days, is about five times short, smaller than it needs to be. It needs to be about nine to ten trillion dollars by the end of this decade. So the question is, how do we get to that finance? How do we get to private capital flowing here? And this is where World Bank Group's leadership is very important. And how do we actually make the system? We need to have many, many different innovation finance to get blended finance, get innovation in it. You will hear from Franny Lottier, who's doing phenomenal work in uh, Africa. You'll hear from Vera Songwi, who, like me, also used to work in the bank. 
about how we can get to a financial outcome that is good for not the planet, good for people, but good for countries. So finances would be a critical thing. So I'm very, very happy that we are focusing on that. The third thing we need to do better, I think, that we are very good at doing as a community is learn faster from each other. Innovation taking place across the world, that we need to be faster at bringing one innovation from one place to another. And you will hear from Claudia Lopez, I think just in a few minutes, in Bogota, you know, that's 600, I think 630 kilometers of cycling, six, seven, eight percent of population actually cycle to work in a phenomenal change that has happened in Bogota. The question is, how did she not only what she did, you will hear, but how did she do it and how can we replicate that other places? So it's an exciting moment. We have work to do. I hope we have a really successful two days here. I'm, I want to thank all of you joining us. I really want to. Um, thank all of you that joined online. This has been phenomenal. I think 4,000 people have registered for this conference. And as you know, in this room, we can only have about less than 1,000 people. So this is a very innovation. I want to thank the bank and its technology for making it work. So thank you for being here. Looking forward to phenomenal two days. So much pressure to be the first conversation of a global gathering for transforming transportation. I know just the two people to take on that pressure. <laughs> Patrick Ashey is the former Prime Minister of Côte d'Ivoire. Patrick, please come and take a seat here on the stage. He is now at the Centre for International Development, a senior fellow at Harvard University, and uh, he will be joining me in that seat just there. Thank you, Patrick. Very good. Either one. Former Prime Minister's choice. Thank you. <laughs> Claudia Lopez is the former mayor of Bogota. Claudia, welcome. She's now an advanced leadership into in initiative fellow, excuse me, at Harvard University. So it is clear that when former leaders die, they go to Harvard University. <laughs> Heaven, I'm not sure, but great to have you. I would love to know from your, your position of leadership, we, we, we're looking at country perspective, also a city perspective. So it's nice to hear those two perspectives. But before we start, what story would you tell us to tell us your commitment to transforming transportation? Claudia, one story. Well, thank you so much for having us here. It's a great pleasure to, to be with all this community thinking about transforming transportation. So I'm, I'm the daughter of a teacher. I'm the oldest of a six siblings family. Uh, I grew up in a low middle income neighborhood and sort of density, proximity and diversity. That's what cities are. That's what they provide opportunities for education, for work, for innovation. And the world is divided between cities already made and cities to be built. That's how we are divided. It's not by nations. It's actually by cities that are already made and need improvement or cities that are still to be made and can be improved. Bogota is the capital of Colombia. Um, it's a large city. It's an 8 million people city in an 11 million metropolitan region. Um, have roughly 40% of the city was self-built by the families. Um, only half of the city was properly planned, previous being inhabited. And I think that's the biggest lesson that Latin America can offer to other regions such as Africa. Do land use planning in advance, decide location. Uh, thus, we can build progressively both the private housing and the public infrastructure because the money is not gonna be there for previously, all the money needed. So it's, the problem is not building progressively. 40% of Bogota was built progressively by families and the other half of the city was progressively built by the government, both the local and the national government. But land use planning, land acquisition before it is built, the value we created, that's the second message, the value we created by living together, that's the main source of finance to do proper cities. We need to capture that 
land value increase that we all create by deciding to live together. That's a public, not a private value, and it should be captured either by taxes or by contributions or developers. The third message I will say in my experience, both as a citizen and as mayor, is um, we have a common, uh, a common uh, I, I don't want to use the word enemy, but a common problem to fight against, which is land speculation. Speculators are the ones who take advantage of the fact that we want to live together, that we create value together, and that uh, people need opportunities for income, for jobs mainly, and that's the reason why they come to the city. So when you do land value planning before in advance, even if you're gonna do that progressively, let's say people is gonna come and probably slums is gonna be formed, but if you are able as city government to say, this is the place in which we're gonna build progressively this neighborhood. This is how we're gonna distribute land in advance. That's the most important probably contribution that you can make both for the present and the future of the prospect of families in a city. And finally, um, I will say in terms of transportation, think about this, at least I'm sure 25% of your citizens in any city around the world walk. It's a quarter of the daily trips, at least a quarter. We are walk. Nature, walking and biking don't need to be decarbonized. It is already decarbonized, right? It can account easily for a third of the trips provide good infrastructure for active mobility. That's the easiest, the cheapest, and the most effective thing. The proper forestry, the proper greening of cities, that's the air conditioning of cities. Trees, forestry, diverse forestry, properly planned around cities, that's the air conditioning. So bring together forestry, space for pedestrians, sidewalks, and cycle lanes. It costs a penny with the cost of one kilometer of Metro, with the cost of one kilometer of BTRs, you can build thousand, thousand kilometers of green pedestrian cycling spaces in your cities. And that's gonna change. And finally, we all know for sure that people will use whatever quality infrastructure we built. If you build avenues for fossil fuel cars, people will use avenues for fossil fuel cars. If you build green corridors for pedestrian cycling and decarbonize public transportation, they will use that. Each mode of transportation generates its own demand. So don't waste resources in gray, fossil fuel avenues, invest in green corridors. Patrick, I anticipated this conversation because you are a former prime minister of Cote d'Ivoire, which means you can go deep, tell us all your dark secrets and feel very comfortable we will only share it with about 2,000 people. <laughs> but it does give you a sense of release to be able to really talk about successes, challenges, lessons learned for implementing sustainable mobility, sustainable transport. What do you want to dish? I think at Harvard, we say Chatham House rules, <laughs> except here we are online, I guess. Uh, it work. Yeah, it doesn't work here. So, uh, thank you very much, first of all, for inviting me uh, today. And now, uh, I'm really uh, happy to be at this stage and be able to share with the audience, the prestigious audiences there, um, the 20 past years experience that I had, not only as a infrastructure minister, but also as prime minister, as you just mentioned. Uh, as you first of all talked about uh, country level. Um, my first 
thought will go to something that uh, the founding father of Cote d'Ivoire said 60 years ago. Road precede development. Road precede development. And you could see that uh, in a very, very remote rural area, if you go there and you ask people between electricity, water supply, road, agriculture, seeds, what do you want? You'll be very surprised. People will tell you road. I happened to be Minister of Economic Infrastructure, uh, started in 2000, and I was in charge as infrastructure about water infrastructure. So I'll go to very located, I mean, remote places, very small villages, and I'll meet women, because very often they are the ones who are fetching the water, who are making long distance, fetching the water. If they don't have clean water, it's really a nightmare for the house. And I'll ask them, out of all the basic needs that you might have in this village, what will be your priority? And she'll say road. And I was really surprised. I said, how come road? You can't even access clean water and you want road? Just meaning that for people, being able to go out from the place they are, either to sell crops because they have, you know, grow crops. If they cannot sell it, they cannot generate revenue. Either to go or visit people or move is very important to people. So he's invested a lot of resources in infrastructure development, not only road, but also port, airport, to develop the country. And the country has witnessed a very fast and important growth for the first 20 years uh, of independence. And then as we move forward, the issue came about how to finance this road. And the World Bank was very active at that time, you know, 30 years back on the road financing. And uh, they will tell you, I want the traffic before I finance the road. And you say, if you finance the road, I'm going to hide the traffic. It was the cheating and the egg issues. So really road development in the African continent started to really stop as, you know, uh, mobilizing resources to be able to finance this world became a real issue because, you know, uh, fiscal constraint, uh, limited budget, difficult access to international resources or private resources to finance road is, I'm pretty sure, even today, the biggest nightmare of any government. For political reason, for economic reason, for any reason, as soon as you're elected or within your uh, campaign, the must ask things by the people is road to be able to access the capital city, the port, the airport, or any area, because they feel that's the way they can improve their livelihood. Now it comes to the city, as you mentioned it, 50% uh, of the population, mainly uh, in my country, but also in many countries in Africa, are now living in a city. I guess it's about 80%, you know, we, we, we still, you know, lagging a little bit behind, but I guess we come there, we're coming there really fast because by 2035, 65% uh, of the population will be living in an urban city. So developing transport within the urban area is becoming a real nightmare for us. Because as you just said, land planification, the, the city are growing at such a speed that the country and the government cannot develop the basic infrastructure as fast as people are moving in. So you see slum being developed here and there and coming after and trying to implement a land development project, a road development project is very, very difficult. So we're moving forward and trying to see strategy-wise multimodality. Actually in Abidjan, having 20% of the population living there, around five to six million people. We're working on road network, naturally. We have 1.1,500 1, 1, buses uh, commuting one million people per day. We're working on the metro project, 37 kilometer line. We're working with the World Bank at the uh, BRT uh, uh, project too. We're working on uh, shipyard because we have a laguna to transport people uh, through the lagoon. 
And we're working also some private people a project on cable car project. So all these should give the opportunity of people to low down the cost of transportation. Because at the end of the day, for the people in the city, they do not want to use up all their budget for transport. Today, we are around 30% sometime of their budget going into transport. You know, So how you will do to make transport costs as low as possible with not being in the position like we're doing now, right now for the city buses to subsidize the ticket. You know, that's a major issue. And that bring up once again, the issue of financing because resources are needed for health, for education, for uh, uh, agriculture, for food, for, for, for shelter, you know, and, and yet you need resources to build road and transportation. So it puts so much pressure that you're looking for very low, let's say concessional rate money to be able to finance this you know, infrastructure. In most of the uh, developing world, at the community level, you know, you, you, you're very lucky because you know, it's, it's arranged another way. Uh, central government is mainly financing the infrastructure of the cities. You know, because the cities are not able to raise enough resources from the infrastructure to be able to finance itself, to raise money by itself. So the, the central government is financing the road. So you develop your road infrastructure or your transport infrastructure, depending on how much resources the central government can allow. And sometimes that doesn't match with your need. So you have to find a very original way to make transportation as easy as possible for people, and that it comes to management. You have Patrick, multimodality. I, I like the phrase, find a very original way. Yeah. What does that really mean? That, that really means that at the end of the day, you have quite you know, an amount of sectors or transporters. You have uh, community buses, you have city buses, you might have metro, you might have, uh, uh, like I say, uh, a cable car, you might have all these things. How do you coordinate, you manage people moving from one point to the other point, talking to each of these stakeholders to make it the shortest possible journey and the cheapest one? It's extremely difficult to manage different transport uh, infrastructure and equipment, and at the same time, being able also to manage public and private. Some of them are managed by the private sector, other ones are managed by the public sector. How do you coordinate all that? Where will be the bus station, the shipyard Laguna station, the metro station? How will they go from the house to the station? All that has to be managed in a way that things are made easier, simpler, and cost-effective for people. Claudia, you have a thought. Patrick's inspired a thought. Share it with Patrick. Um, so you, you made a, a very crucial question. What is actually the innovation here? What are we talking about? What is innovation at the moment? So let me give you these figures. 65% of public transportation trips are made by women. 65% of fossil fuel car trips are made by men. Girls and women and elders do more than half of the walking trips in every city. Women in almost every city, particularly in more than half of the planet population in the global south. Work more, work longer, and are paid less. And that's the biggest source of inequity in our cities and in our planet. So do you want a simple planning trip to do or advice to follow? Plan your cities thinking as a girl and build your cities moving as a woman. 
Claudia. That will be the simplest and probably most advancing thing to do. Why? Why? I Who thought walks? you would have said thinking like a woman, moving like a man. No, that's exactly the wrong thing. If we move like a man, then we move mainly by fossil fuel private cars. That's unsustainable. That's unfinanciable. That's undesirable. <laughs> if you move, Sally, if you the, move. the women are clapping. The men are not clapping. Well, clap. <laughs> so you are all promoting change. Men of this world, welcome to change. Because if we move the way you move, the planet won't you would like to have a debate <laughs> with Claudia and Patrick, now is your moment. The microphone is right there. Stand behind it because I'm going to only give you about five or six minutes. You actually want to have this conversation right now. Online, O'Neill is the moderator, right, O'Neill? Do you have anything to share with me right now or are you going to gather the information? We got one question that I can share. Go um, ahead. And the question is, what do you think is the prevalent critical cause of disconnect between transport practitioners and the public in shaping a sustainable transport according to the peculiar need of its subject population? Was that from somebody from the World Bank? <laughs> I don't know that probably. question sounds highly <laughs> suspicious. Uh, I agree. Who sent that question in from the World Bank? <laughs> I know your questions. Okay, let me just add following the question. So I will answer to the question, really, really. And this is not a woman thing. This is a simple, rational survival thing, really. We cannot move on private fossil fuel cars, period, period. That's, that's a simple, obvious thing. So who moves differently from that? Girls from move move differently from that. Elders and women, we walk more, we use more public transportation. That's a fact, everywhere. The mode of transportation that we use, the less that we should mo use more is biking. And biking is the other way around, at least in Bogota and I can guess almost everywhere. Two thirds of the biking trips are done by men. So Good man, you're, you're learning. Bike more, <laughs> bike more, that's good. That's why nature, pedestrian sidewalks or malls and cycling lanes could come together. They are the cheapest, the most efficient, the most sustainable things to move, promote active mobility. And the second thing that I will mention to the question is to my friends of the World Bank, of the IDB, of the Asian Development the Banks, we in the cities, we have the people, we have the innovation, we have the solutions, but guess what? We don't have the money because you put us in a very lengthy red tape bureaucratic process after our, sorry, national governments. When we have by far better financial standards than our own national governments. So come on, you have been thinking through this for 20 years. Let's make it happen these years. Set up the conditions for lending money directly to the cities without the red tape of bureaucracies at international banks or governments or national governments. So I, I'm gonna give you some inside information. Patrick is actually married to a mayor, not this one. <laughs> and he knows the frustrations of mayors regarding uh, money I, I, I guess yeah. I guess uh, well, I just want to say that uh, you know she was talking about the practitioner and uh, uh, you know the, the 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 government or the the, the planning institution and the, the, the academics I mean all the people who are thinking about the developing urban area or road infrastructure first of all I'm sorry but people do not feel concerned even if I agree with her if it's fossil fuel, if it's green uh, 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 road, if it's green car, if it's a green metro, they just want a ride. And the cheapest ride. We are the one who are concerned about all these issues, decarbonization and all that. But in their daily life, they, they are not confronted to that. They just want to be able to move around at the cheapest and the fastest way. 
So the, the divide is there. They are not really aware, I mean, most of them, the majority of the issue going on, except when, for instance, sometime with the climate change, and I was going to that, you will see now uh, in certain area, even in the capital city, 24 hours, 240 millimeters rainfall, flooding all over the places, giving us a hard time with road maintenance, cost again, giving us a hard time with public transportation management. But at the end of the day, we are the one who want to reduce, to decarbonize the, the, the transport sector. For instance, as far as we're concerned, we have limited the age of car importation to five years. More than five years, it doesn't come in the country. Since we're not producing car, 100% of the cars are imported, and people used to import uh, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years used car from Europe or elsewhere, and that was the worst you know, crime you can even imagine, you know, green-wise. So we limited that, and we could see the impact. You know. Now, th that's where I was coming from agreeing with her. At the end of the day, once again, we're talking about all this financing coming in green, decarbonized, whatever, to change the picture, to change the journey, to change the narrative. We all want to change the narrative. Me, I want to build walkway. I want to be bike, you know, ways uh, on the road that didn't have that before in the city. But I need to displace people to build them. At the end of the day, we want a dream like you. We want good thing for our people. Where do you get the money? Now, I will answer, I will ask you, it's me who should ask you like her. Central government, a local government, both of them are asking you, where is that carbon money you've been talking about for years and years in conference and conference? We just don't say it. I get money from the multilateral agencies. I get money from the private sector. None of them are telling me that it's carbonized, it's decarbonized. I don't know the color of a carbonized or decarbonized money. It's just a money. You have to borrow. You have to pay the interest rate. So if there is a place where I can get free borrowing, free interest borrowing money that is decarbonized, tell it to me. Because at the end of the day, that's the question. We know what to do. We know what we want. We have example all over the world. We know how our people want. We know what is good for them. Where do we get the money to do it? Am I right? No, I mean, men and women can at least on this side. We agree, uh, we agree on other. that. But Patrick make a very important point here. Which is, there is an order. I mean, we all want to save the planet for sure. We all know the, the, the price of livery and rights and duties and democracies. But we need to make this compatible. And there is only one way to lead, which is to lead by example. And not by, by what we say, it's by what we do. Action is what makes the difference, no words. And action need investments, as Patrick says. But it's not only need investments and money to be able to do it, but it, there is an order. So let me sort of rephrase what I agree of what just Patrick said. You cannot pretend, it's immoral to pretend that the large majority of the population of this planet, which is under hunger and poverty and unemployment and informality and despair, has to, on top of that, save the planet at the expense of its own opportunities, on its own pockets. So you wanna care for the planet? then care first for the people. People need, need, and we all need to comply the Sustainable Development Goals, which has one goal that we have never achieved, which is to stop hunger, to stop war, to stop abuse. Caring for people, offering them freedom, and education, and jobs, and care. That's the right that people want to do. From home to care, from care to education, from education to job to come back to home. Jobs, care, education, and jobs. That's the thing transportation needs to connect. That's all. And the more dense, the more proximate, the more closer, they are the better. We all know that. 
So care for the people because only we care for the people first. We will have democracies that can care and compromise globally for the planet. It's not the other way around. As long as I've been alive, I haven't seen, you know, dictatorships and autocrats don't even care for their own people, even less for the rest of the people in this planet. You need people who can compromise, who can be held accountable. It means to have democratic processes in your societies. But you're not going to have democratic processes in your societies if you keep half of your population of more under hunger and poverty and exclusion. So care for the people so that we have people and citizens who can care for democracies and democracies that can compromise and act globally to care for the planet. There is an order here that matters. Patrick, uh, finally, you are teaching at Harvard. What is the assignment you would like to give us for the next two days and the year between 2024 TT and 2025 TT? A short, achievable assignment where we can get an A+. Plus. I mean, uh, the seminars that I'm uh, giving at Harvard has to do, we were talking about uh, uh, earlier, um, has to do with um, unlocking the potential for the African continent to speed up its development. Unlocking the potential. As we all know, I won't come back to that, there's so much potential here and there uh, that need to be used to help the country move forward. The country has been moving quite well these past years, but when you look at what Southeast Asia has been able to do in Asia in general in the past 50 years, you could see that there is a margin of progression and quite uh, fast progression. But at the end of the day, there are many issues that we go around. Then we come back to the financing, financing the development, you know. And today, most of our countries are confronted with uh, priorities that they have to manage, you know, they have, you know, they're like she was just saying, you know, health, education, agriculture, uh, energy, uh, infrastructure, so on and so forth. And I have to add to that security issues, you know, and climate issues. Now, the local budget and fiscal room is not enough to take care of all that. Uh, give credit to the leaders. I won't come to the political issue of democracy or not democracy, you know, so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, some people within the government want to improve the livelihood of their population. And yet here they are not having enough resources. You know, the cost of resources outside today, the, the, the burden on, on, the, on the debt service is so high that you have to refrain yourself from taking too much Money outside. Now, how do you go for that? What do you prioritize? Now, the climate is coming on the picture, like she said, you know. Uh, agriculture, climate agriculture. Uh, 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 energy, climate energy. Road, uh, transport, infrastructure, climate infrastructure. You know, everything comes with that. Now, where is the climate money? Is that that's, the assignment still? Yeah, yeah. that's this what the I want to see Where is now, the climate money? I'm pretty Find sure. It? Now, there's a new challenge, and okay. I think the World Bank and all these people are very bright. With every single challenge, they have behind a very good original initiative on the challenge solution, which is the money. So the okay. carbon, the climate, the green money that we've been talking from COP to COP, from conference to conference, the government do not really get a good grasp of what it is, where it is, how do we get it, is it cheap, is it free, how much it costs, well, you know, we, don't, we yet don't have it. Yet we have the challenge to meet. So I got, by one year from now, when your conference will be done, someone will be on the stage, you know, a guest speakers, that time from the World Bank on the panel, will be there sitting there, and I'll be pleased to ask you the question. Thank you very much. Okay. Ashi, Claudia Lopez, you set the bar high for every single conversation we have to have in the next two days. We thank you. Thank you.
Excellent. It's my mobile. Thank you. You're such a prime minister. <laughs> Taking care of business. Our next plenary, in fact, our very first plenary is scaling finance, finance for low carbon transport. Let me invite the panelists onto stage. We're going to take chair number two, three, four, and five. Vijay Kumar Saswat, welcome. And Masu Tadese, good to see you. I feel like he's going to take up residence at the the Preston Auditorium. Uh, two, three, four, or five. You can take either, any of those chairs. Paul Bodner. Paul, hey, fantastic. Great. And Franny Lutier. Hello, Franny. Thank you. Please come onto the stage. Thank you very much. Excellent. Very good. Setting the scene for this conversation, our keynote is Anna Marie Ibanez, Vice President for Sectors and Knowledge at the IADB. Anna, I like your sense of drama walking across the entire stage to get to this podium over here. Welcome. There will be applause to help you walk across <laughs> the entire stage. Thank you. Hey. Good morning to all. I'm really pleased to be here uh, sharing this, this panel with colleagues from the World Bank, from the World Resources Institutes, governments, uh, and the civil society and the private sector as well. And for me, it's really an honor to, to give uh, the opening remarks for this panel on how to mobilize finance for, for climate action and for transportation. Uh, it's a segue, a very good segue to the conversation between Claudia and Patrick, who were talking precisely about that. I would like to thank the World Bank and the World Resources Institute for the invitation of, uh, to the IDB to partner in this important event for the transport community uh, in developing countries. As Claudia mentioned, transport connects us and it connects us to opportunities, it connects us to essential services. In Latin America and the Caribbean, one of the regions that the most unequal regions in the world and where 30% of its population lives under the poverty line, Public transportation is very important to link families to jobs, healthcare, and education. And this is especially important for the vulnerable population. For example, the BRT, the Bus Rapid Transit System in Lima, increased access to jobs by nearly 7%. Remarkably, the cable car system in Medellin increased these opportunities by 100%. A study done by Roman Sarate from the World Bank shows, for example, that access to the metro lines uh, in Mexico City increased formality uh, uh, for uh, uh, formal employment for the vulnerable population. Put simply, transport fuels economic growth. And this growth is very important to overcome poverty and also to finance the green energy transition that we need to uh, pursue. But, and this is a very big but, Transportation takes a toll in, on the environment. In contrast to other regions uh, where energy is the main source of pollutant, Latin America relies on a relatively clean energy matrix. Instead, 40% of the CO2 emissions in our region comes from transportation, and this number is steady, is not dropping. Our study says that if countries do not take bolder actions now in transportation, we will not be able to reach the targets of the Paris Agreement of 2030. This is a little over five years, so it's, there is not much time really uh, to achieve these goals. So like many other regions, and like uh, Claudia and Patrick were mentioning, Latin America and the Caribbean faces really the dual challenge of growing its economies, providing opportunities for the population, while also uh, coping with the economic and social effects of climate change. And Latin America and the Caribbean is particularly vulnerable to, to climate change. I would say it's one of the most vulnerable regions to, to global warming. We have droughts, forest fires, floods, and hurricanes that are becoming ever more intense and ever more frequent. For example, when we examine the yearly losses due to storm damages in countries in the Caribbean, uh, this amount to three yearly to 
0.6% of their GDP is sizable. In addition, we see that countries in our regions have really little fiscal space to close the infrastructure gaps of today. What is the infrastructure gap in Latin America and the Caribbean? If we want to meet the SDG goals by 2030, the infrastructure SDG goals, we will need to invest over 3% of our GDP annually in infrastructure. This is about $2.2 trillion annually that we will need to invest. Currently, we are investing 1.8% of our GDP in infrastructure and 08 in transport. So we are nowhere near these figures. We need to invest much, much more if we want to be efficient, inclusive, uh, and have a sustainable transport systems that really improve the quality of lives while promoting sustainable growth. And we believe at the IDB that multilateral development banks are part of the solution and should be part of the solution. How can we help countries uh, achieve these goals? First, with the traditional uh, concessional finances for sustainable infrastructure, such as the metro lines, such as BRTs projects, like the one we are co-financing with the World Bank, the, the European Investment Bank, and CAF across Latin America. But our loans, our grants are really far from being sufficient to meet the goals that I already mentioned. The gaps are very big. So to do this, and this is a second point I want to make here, we need to mobilize private capital. This is very important. And we need to mobilize private capital for low carbon projects. And we can use uh, green bonds, infrastructure bonds, blended finance mechanisms and PPPs. At the IDB, we provide support for mobilizing this capital. And we are stepping up our role to help countries in our region to mobilize it through innovative financial mechanisms. So far, about 30% of the green and sustainable bonds issued by our region was backed, were backed by the IDB group. Uh, and also for every dollar of blended finance, the IDB group is leveraging between nine to $10 towards climate. Third, and very important as well, the MDBs can help the risk projects so they become more attractive for private investors. This is very important for developing countries. We can do this through various mechanisms such as political risk insurance, credit enhancements, and guarantees. Fourth, and last, and very importantly so, MDBs can really work with governments to implement policies and institutional reforms that support sustainable transportation. Some of those are the removal of subsidies, to fossil fuels, but by providing other alternatives for transportation, the adaptation of regulations that reflect the actual environmental and social cost of transportation, and the deployment of training to empower local stakeholders to implement innovative approaches. Our work in electric mobility in the region is one example of what I am already measuring, uh, mentioning. We are helping a large number of countries to develop their electric mobility roadmaps through a technical assistance. We are putting in place the technical and economic policies to encourage the energy transition. We are assisting national and local governments because as Claudia mentioned, local governments play a very important role in finding uh, innovative financial mechanisms. And we are providing loans for changing infrastructure and bus fleet renewal programs to both public and private sectors. Many of the concepts that I am mentioning are embodied in our new institutional strategy, which focuses on reducing poverty and inequality, very important, fostering sustainable growth and fighting climate change. And promoting sustainable mobility across the region is really key to achieve these goals. With the capital increase of IDB Invest, the IDB, will expect to bring, the IDB group will expect to bring 112 billion in additional financing over the next years to the Latin American region, with the replenishment of IDB Lab, we will foster innovation across the region. And we will enhance our role as a knowledge bank, which is crucial to provide technical support and knowledge to the governments in the region uh, to uh, go through the energy transition. So the challenge is large and the financial needs are significant. 
Governments, private actors, civil society, and MDBs working together can rise to the occasion, but we really do need to work together. So I celebrate the opportunity to be here, of being together at Transforming Transportation 2024, and encourage all of you to take advantage of these days to create synergies, drive innovation, and build momentum towards a transportation system that meets the, the needs of both people and the planet. The actions we take today uh, will drive our future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your keynote. I would like you to appreciate how much expertise we have on stage. Franny, um, can, when people say hello to you and you introduce yourself, Anna Maria, are you staying for the panel? You can stay if you want to. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Fanny, when, pe when you say hello to people and they say, well, Fanny, what do you do? What do you tell them? Habari za asubui. Anyone speak Swahili in the room? I thought, yes. Fabi, you fixed this because the World Bank and the World Resources Institute make me feel very welcome with the image that you have chosen for this year's TT. That is a photograph of a very important crossing in Dar es Salaam. Ah. And the reason I like it ah. is actually it's a, it's a great photo to talk about innovation in finance. Because in that photo, you see the past, the present, and the future. What is the past? The infrastructure you see, the roads, were built using government money, and they actually borrowed, including at some point, from the World Bank. The barriers you see in the middle, those concrete barriers, were put as a safety measure to prevent cars from turning and going to the market that you see in the image. And then you see there are buses, including BRT. So there's a solution for electric buses right there, uh, but those use uh, natural gas right now. And then you see pedestrian and cargo all in the same image. But what I wanted to point out are three things. You see those parasol, the umbrellas there in blue and yellow? It has a mark called Tigo. That's the largest telco, and it's a mobile payment platform, all privately financed. Initially by Sweden, who owned Tigo, and then sold it to the first African investor, Axia. So in that is a kernel of a solution for financing, which is... What did the World Bank do in telecoms in the 1990s? It phased out of funding telecoms, but it did two very important things. It did the knowledge, research, and policy to open up the telco sector for private investment. It put in a lot of efforts in understanding the value of the knowledge economy, which drove the investments in the sector, and then let the private sector and governments come in and solve the problem and use those resources then to invest in roads and rail and ports and, and, and airports. Second point I want to point out, you see the crossing, you have pedestrians and, and a person in a bicycle. So that's both active mobility, including for cargo, because you see the lady carrying cargo on the head and the gentleman is, will be putting cargo on the bicycle. Uh, uh. So from that, very easily you can go to from active mobility to electric mobility, because they are coming from quite a distance to be able to walk there. And you know, if you don't have good nutrition, that is quite difficult to do in 40 degrees centigrade and humid. And humid. So going from that to electric is quite easy to do. Third, that crossing that you see, the zebra crossing, I thought they named that zebra crossing after East Africa because we have a lot of zebras there. But uh, what is interesting about it, WRI, under the Ross Price for Cities, the very first Ross Price for Cities, which is a price that goes to the most innovative urban solutions, was given to a, an organization in Dar es Salaam that was actually helping school kids cross safely from one end of the street to the other. Because before that, there were no such zebra crossings. There were no solutions that allow, kids would have to run to avoid those buses and trucks coming very fast. So solutions for financing three innovations there make the policy environment uh, attractive to the private sector to come in, leverage philanthropic capital for the right solutions that would allow active mobility to move, Third, 
ride the wave of the advantage developing countries have, which is they need to solve three things at once, electricity, transport, and the cargo solutions, including for nutrition, because right there, there is a market. So the agricultural solutions with products coming from rural areas need to be brought to the cities and you need to solve those. You can do that by financing a package that the government produces the infrastructure. 90% of all infrastructure now is funded by government. That the private sector comes in with solutions for energy and transport because you, you see the electric lines there. They're coming from a hydro station quite far from, from uh, this place. And when the rains are short during drought, there is no electricity. So if you want a transport revolution, you need to use the sun because that will be abundantly available. But then you have to have somebody to pay for the charging stations or give the monopoly for a few years to a private operator to actually take the risk. And these are things the World Bank can do quite easily and other MDBs by offering that platform uh, to, to do that. Fanny, yes. Uh, I am going to test the attendees on this photograph on the way out. Did you have any idea how much information was in that picture? <laughs> it's extraordinary. If you don't score 100 as you leave this building, Franny will have you in detention. So the question I asked Franny, who is obviously um, rehearsing to be a politician, was <laughs> when people say hello to you, what do you tell them you do? Franny, you are not allowed to answer that now. But Paul, please go ahead. Gentlemen, I'm gonna go down the line because I really want people to understand your expertise because at any time they want to, either online or right there at the microphone, stand at the microphone and then you're immediately part of this plenary. Okay, uh, Paul, go ahead. Sure, I will try to be very direct. So uh, I work for the Bezos Earth Fund, which is the largest uh, philanthropic commitment ever made to support climate action and protect nature. And I try to harness my experience across government, private finance, and nonprofits to uh, help each of those categories get into a mode where instead of saying, after you, they're saying, follow me. Ah, great. Admasi. Good morning. I um, run a regional financial institution. We are a very interesting outfit in the sense that we combine conventional development finance with pension fund money and, and other forms of uh, private sector finance. And we do it in a way that essentially blends our capital structure and allows us to multiply and accelerate access to finance. I think the, the former prime minister said it all in the morning. He said, it's all about the F word, the good F word. And, <laughs> and so I, I, I stumbled there for a moment, but. <laughs> so the but good F word. The good F word. Could be read either way. Well, exactly. For, 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 for us in, in the continent, when we look at the access to finance problems that we have, uh -huh. it's, 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 it's not just access, it's cost and it's prohibitive. And it's gotten worse in recent years uh -huh. to the point where it's just really un unmanageable. So I think this is why you see the very concerted commentary coming from a former prime minister, because as, as World Bank people like to use in economic terms, the binding constraint is finance. And the cost of it. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. VJ, um, about 20 minutes ago, I said, Hello, Dr. VJ, welcome. So nice to see you. When people say hello to you, what do you tell them that you do? Yeah, uh, I, I come from India and represent uh, an institution called National Institute for Transformation of India. That's called Niti Ayo. And my role has been primarily for uh, science, technology, innovation in the energy, transportation, and mobility sector. So there has been a major focus on bringing in alternate uh, fuels, bringing in mobility, electric mobility, bringing in climate control through decarbonization actions in the energy sector, whether it is industrial, whether it's transport, or it is uh, in the buildings and so on. So the focus is primarily to get finances for every of these activities, which are requiring the basic inputs in developing the infrastructure, running various schemes, which will lead to uh, what we call as the progress in that dimension. So basically it is 
working between the private sector, mm -hmm. the international financing institutions like World Bank, IMF, and so on, to generate funds on a public-private partnership basis, whether it is for alternate fuels or for India's program for mobility, e-mobility, and so on. Measures have been taken with respect to evolving new schemes. Uh, for example, yesterday we discussed what is called, uh, uh, you know, payment uh, security mechanism uh, with the World Bank and the government of uh, US and things like that. So these are the various measures I work on. And uh, today's discussion would be basically to showcase how India has progressed in this particular sector of transforming transportation. Uh, analysts, I love how pragmatic, not just this conversation is about scaling up financing for low carbon transport, but the entire conference is like, we need the money. How are we going to get the money? Paul? I just want to say one more thing, Vijay Kumar. I think, you know, we say it's the answer to your question is it's not rocket science. I believe uh, we have a rocket scientist on the panel. Yes. <laughs> so maybe maybe if it does come to rocket science, you can you can do that part. OK, I'm gonna I will be able to part. help the community. No problem. <laughs> You've left that out of your bio, but I did read it. Um, so look, I, I think I think the world is not short of financial resources to do this. The problem, in particular, for those who work here and in, in the context of the World Bank and emerging markets and developing countries, is how do you get how do you persuade uh, private finance to flow to places where it does not ordinarily invest? And that just doesn't just mean north to south, right? It's strange when the pension fund of a country of in the in the global south is invested in, let's say, London real estate, as, as someone was telling me recently for a country I won't name. And then people who live in that London real estate go to work at DFID and figure out how to support people in the country whose who's, who's, you know, money is invested in London real estate. So, so uh, uh, you know, th this, th there, there is plenty of capital available uh, in private markets. There is not plenty of capital available in public markets. There's a, a crunch in fiscal space. So, public sector is squeezed. Um, philanthropy is a very valuable resource, but it's very limited. Even, you know, $10 billion that Jeff Bezos pledged sounds like a lot of money over 10 years to give away, but the world is a big place and there's an infinite need for capital expenditure. So we just have to be as smart as possible about how to stack these different uh, these different forms of capital together. Franny has done an amazing job at Southbridge um, and teaching us all how to do that. But you know, I think if there's one force that we can activate in, in service of that, that we haven't done a great job of doing, I would still say it's markets. You know, those of us who grew up working on climate, I've been doing it for 25 years, probably most of us in some way spent the first 20 years in and around the UNFCCC process, because government, because it's natural to think that governments are there to solve big collective action problems like climate change, right? And, and that and that's that's true, but we haven't really activated market forces yet that have an actual track record of driving fast, deep, uh, and broad change in the global economy. Right? There wasn't there wasn't ride share in San Francisco twenty years ago, fifteen maybe even fifteen years ago, widely available. Now there's ride share in Ulaanbaatar. What made that happen? It wasn't policy, right? It was entrepreneurship. It, it, the fact that solar costs have come down was supported by government policy, but it was driven by by market forces as well. So I think if, if I would say one thing that we need to do is to combine very smartly the limited amount of government capital we have, the even more limited but more nimble uh, philanthropic capital we have, and figure out how to do a better job of activating markets in service of this mission. Mm. Admasu, oh. Go, go ahead and then, Franny, you, you jump in. Yeah, I, I want to agree with the last point Paul made. And uh, sorry, I was too excited about the photo. I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> so my past was at the World Bank and I worked with Guang, uh, Jose Irigoyen and others, Anidas Gupta. So it's like coming home. Mm -hmm. My present is at Southbridge uh, Investments, where I lead an investment uh, uh, group that uh, brings innovation into the challenges that Africa is facing, taking capital from outside Africa and combining it with cap capital within Africa. So what Paul just said, I think, is really fundamental because we have a lot of capital in private hands, 
which is not flowing because it's looking for opportunities which, is, which are not visible. And entrepreneurs, as you say, are the key. So we have in this room a number of entrepreneurs who have interesting projects that they are putting their own capital to develop, and they need scaling up. But the scaling up cannot happen purely by going to the capital markets because they don't see them. They're too risky. It won't come from the World Bank and other MDBs because they're too small. It won't come from the pension funds because pension funds are looking for secure returns to meet their obligations. And philanthropy would not give it to them because they are for profit. So you need a way to bring these four sources of capital in order to support those entrepreneurs who bring that change. So some of the innovations we've been uh, uh, engaging in are really using philanthropic capital to crowd in market resources by, for example, uh, paying down the cost of capital, by bringing in blended solutions at the project level, by using philanthropic capital to take early risks, by using philanthropic capital to actually show how it can be done, exit, and go and take even harder problems elsewhere. So we're doing this in reforestation and restoration where carbon markets are very critical, particularly for transport transformation. Because if carbon markets work, a lot of the financing that Patrick asked about in the previous panel could actually come from a properly functioning carbon market. Carbon tax is not working as well. Uh, in Paris recently, I saw an announcement that if you have a, an SUV, you pay more for parking. But if your SUV is electric, you pay less. So that's a tax incentive to push the transformation towards lower carbon. But it has a huge cost because the majority of people who drive into Paris are actually lower income uh, than those who actually li live within Paris and who can walk and use bicycles. So this is a, a solution that may work for some places, but not all places. Because sometimes in the U.S. as well, it's the poor who drive fossil fuel cars. So how do we get that transformation in a way that is inclusive would require a lot of innovation in electric mobility that can solve both problems at the same time. And then lastly on innovation, I also in my past was working for Admasu and uh, we, we did experiment with a lot of things. We took risk, it was a commercial bank, but we took risks. And the advantage is that we took risks on our profits that then showed that it's done, it can be done. Then World Bank, MIGA and others came in. And I think there's a role then for national development banks and regional development banks to actually take that early risk, but it shouldn't come at the cost to their profits because they are having members who are, re, re, uh, are investing in them to get a dividend. So there could be another role for philanthropy in this case to actually pair up with the regional development banks to take that early experimental role. And then the MDBs can come in with concessional finance and, and crowd in commercial finance. I must go ahead. Well, Femi, I, I was very happy to, to, to hear Franny making that connection because I think what Paul highlighted in his remarks was the perception is, is that, you know, capital scarce regions come to capital rich regions ha cap in hand, always asking for, for, for the money, right? Now, I, I, I'm very pleased to share with the audience that when the SDGs came out and we went into a recapitalization process, we decided to hit African pension funds, African insurance companies, African sovereign wealth funds before we crossed the Atlantic or the Indian Ocean. And today I have almost 15 shareholders who are African institutional shareholders in a, in a, in a capital structure that's mixed between governments and, and institutional investors. So this is a, a classic blended capital structure that crowds in the private sector in an institutional space. And so we've managed to do it, and now we've, we've stepped out of the continent and we're reaching out to foundations and institutional investors elsewhere. But really, the, the crux of the theme we're discussing today is about thematic finance, and again, for us to, 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 to sort of give an opportunity that's, that's attractive to potential investors the rest of the world, we've come out with something called green capital. So we, we launched Class C green shares which we basically put out there and we, 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 we made a, a proposition to investors for every dollar of green 
capital they put into us, we guarantee a threefold throughput in terms of the green financing that we would be doing. And we, we basically unveiled it at the COP27, the Sharm el Sheikh one, the African COP, and then we, we practically uh, started rolling it out at the last COP. So today we have uh, green capital over and above the green funding that we have from strong partners like the World Bank Group. And so we're blending equity and debt very thematic. And, and this is uh, looking beyond green. It's also sustainability. It's about the jobs, it's the SDGs and all of that. And so for us, we've, we've been trying to walk the talk because in the final analysis, when you're in an African country and you face a stakeholder, they say, you know, we go to all the conferences, everybody talks the money, nobody walks the money. So, yeah, I think it's there's a pipeline issue. There's an upstream problem. I think there's a point that's been made around us not having enough packaged opportunities to put out to potential investors. That's received a lot of attention. We've got some great investors who come in and they've said to us, you can keep the dividend, but not in your normal pool of money. You, we want to see the healthy profitability. We want to see the dividends, but put it into a special trust fund and use that dividend money to generate new projects. Take more risks. Don't do it off your capital structure because we know you're a rated bank. You have, you know, obviously, you know, various conventions and, 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 and issues to manage on the risk side. But you have these special pools now of money that we can start being much more innovative with and help sponsors, project sponsors who are really constrained to find enough risk capital upstream, get them to, to actually um, take on more and then who, throw your weight behind them. Who says that? Who comes to a bank and tells them, this is where you should put this, this is where you should put this amount because they're thinking about sustainability? Who does that? Well, you know, banks have shareholders and, and, and critical stakeholders. So okay. you'll only do what they allow you to do in the final analysis, right? So I think that's why Paul talked about the public markets being very constrained because their owners just have no more appetite for, for, for putting more out there. So, I mean, in the end for us, we, we, we do have a, a, a triple bottom line value proposition that we've put out to pension funds and many others. And they've allowed us to take more risk. We will go into very fragile economies. Uh, we were here about a month ago on the fragile conference, right? We're Fragility forum. How do you get to that last mile? How you get? How do you get to those really tough markets, right? And some could argue they're not even markets yet. They need to be made into markets. And so, the question is, when you're there. In fact, yesterday, I had after the the, the morning session we had with World Bank colleagues, I had an investor, a U.S. investor, who who has a very interesting green project in a country called the DRC. And, and, and basically he's, you know, there's a lot of people who want to talk to me because they love my project. He says, but the reality is I trust you, even though you have less than the others. And I said, wow, why are you saying that? And he said, bottom line is people don't have risk appetite. They'll get caught up in committees. They'll get up, caught up in policies. In the final analysis, people just can't take that step to go into these tough, hard markets. Mm -hmm. All right. I see the questions are lining up. I'm going to just get a perspective from India, and then I'll come right back to the questions there, and then also chatting to the online people when we've got some online questions. Um, how is India handling this idea of scaling up financing what can you point to where you say okay we, we've worked this out this is working for us see india has uh, right from 2018 taken a very uh, concrete steps with respect to financing the transformation of mobility if you have heard our prime minister in 2020 during the global summit he mentioned that india's basis for transformation of transport sector would be based on seven C's, which is common, connected, con uh, convenient, congestion free, change, clean, and cutting edge. These are some of the things which he the highlighted. The seven C's? Seven C's. All right. Yeah. Do them now. <laughs> now. So, you don't know them? I know them. The clean, clear, connected, change, and, uh, you know, and the cheap. <laughs> so all of them. I know you know them. <laughs> so these are the things which we were actually uh, based on which we have planned sure. that. But in addition to that, there has been an investment which is absolutely required for doing this kind of transformation. And hence, right from the day one, we started schemes like FAME, 
the faster adoption for, and manufacturing of e-mobility. The FAME 1 started in 2015, FAME 2 started later, and basically it was for manufacturing as well as for adoption. Then came that we should be able to reduce the cost of what Madam mentioned just like that, that the availability of the e-transportation should be for the poor. And if the cost is not reduced, then you have a problem. So basically investment on um, alternate chemistry cells so that you are able to reduce the cost thereby. Then came other modes of uh, reducing the, the fossil fuel emissions and hence started working on what is called biofuel programs. And then again, the Indian government started a biofuel E20 program. For example, in the case of FAME, we, we pitched in with the money of something like $67 billion. In the case of ACC, another similar amount. So these are the basic Government initiated things. Then came, how do you bring in incentives for the private sector? How do you bring it the public and the private to work together? So we started calling what is the PLI schemes, the production linked incentives. And these production linked incentives were basically to promote the manufacturing agencies to prom large to upscale the manufacturing. And if they are able to do it beyond a certain value, then the incentives are provided in that. So PLI schemes started coming in. Then we also said that why not go for other, other uh, methods of reducing emissions? And that was hydrogen as one of the carriers. So Indian government started giving an incentive for hydrogen uh, in um, production, both in terms of reducing the cost of electrolyzers and uh, bringing down the cost of hydrogen and so on. So almost about 6,000 uh, crores were identified for doing that. So you can see the financing mechanisms are both in terms of promoting the investment from the private sector and also for promoting the government to make in investment on infrastructure. When you talked of infrastructure, we decided that certain corridors have to be created, whether it is on the seaside or it is on the roadside. So we went into what is called Bharat Mala program. That means you create a green corridor for the e-mobility sectors, almost about 8,000, uh, sorry, uh, 14,000 kilometers of road network to create with the possibility that calling them the green corridor. Then we also said Bharat, uh, the, what is called Bharat Mala. India has got a coastline of almost about 7,800 kilometers of the, the sun. So that 7,800 kilometer waterways to be created with almost like about 14,500 crores. So this kind of investment coming from the government has helped to promote the transformation. But alongside the public-private uh, participation has been promoted. So non-banking financing institutions have been uh, identified for promoting two-wheeler, three-wheeler, and uh, other e-bus programs and so on, where they should be, like for yesterday we mentioned to you that we have a program for 5,000 e-buses in the country. And that is also being funded through a public-private partnership mode. We have Tata's and other banking agencies coming together to fund such programs. Mm -hmm. So it is the public-private uh, combined funding, but initiatives for major infrastructure development to be taken by the government of India has been the source and the policy what we have been following. Okay. Paul, quickly, because otherwise you'll get laser stares from the <laughs> Q&A line. Yes. Go ahead. So just, just before we get into the questions, just to offer one more way of thinking about this, because we, we want to focus on transportation. I think the eighth C... <laughs> Uh, I, I would I would suggest we focus on is commerce. Um, the the predominant sort of source of transportation emissions and journeys, if even looking at this photo here, has to do with commerce. Of course, people travel for all sorts of reasons. They 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 do so for leisure and to visit their families and to go to you know, but they go to work. And and it, what, one thing that I found very useful in thinking about finance and transportation is to. Imagine how the place that you're trying to help or deal with is connected to other places, right? So, this, so Franny gave us an amazing tour of this photograph. I'll give you one more quick example. At the, the, one of the things we've been supporting at the Bezos Earth Fund is the development of industrial, green industrial hubs. And I recently visited the port of Los Angeles. And you imagine trying to decarbonize all of the transport related things happening at a big port. You've got huge container ships running on heavy fuel oil, 
right? You've got the all the heavy equipment that's used to move containers around running on diesel. And then you have, in the case of the Port of Los Angeles, 20,000 trucks a day coming in to unload these containers and take them where they need to go, also running on diesel. If you build out a hydrogen economy, right, or, or, or an electric, uh, a combination of uh, electrifying and powering with hydrogen, the heavy transport system, you know, you have to think about how these places are connected and, and creating entire value chains that don't exist today. So let's just not forget that, that achieving our goals on transportation does often rebound to fixing the energy system. <laughs> and some of that is just about scaling the systems we have, scaling grids, um, and making it possible to generate more green electricity. But some of it is about creating an entirely new energy system around green molecules. Thank you for your patience, sir. Go ahead. Well, you're welcome. The, the question is relatively simple. Uh, private, private capital can invest in, if there is a return on investment, but for transforming, uh, in particular cities, you have some investments that doesn't have any return. I just uh, speak about sidewalk or uh, what we, if you are doing a cycling lane, there is no return on investment. And most probably for the infrastructure of heavy uh, public transport infrastructure like metro or rail line, you have no return on investment on the infrastructure part, on the um, operation, you have a return on investment. On the infrastructure, you have not. So the question is in line uh, with what says the prime minister in the, in the first panel. Where can we mobilize finance, perhaps through carbon market, uh, to have actually grants that will come in developing country for being able to finance those infrastructure that will not be um, possibly financed by the private sector because basically there is no return on investment. Thank you. Mm. Franny. Um, that's an excellent question. And I'll give an example and then go to, I think, where we can go for finance. So the example is Lome in Togo, where you have a private company called Spiro that manufactures electric motorcycles. They're able to do that profitably because they were, they were given for a number of years the monopoly on the charging stations and the monopoly on the swapping of batteries. So that's a way where the government, through incentives, can create a pathway for private investment. Now, the challenge they're having is scaling, particularly going to the rural areas. And the second challenge is affordability for individuals to actually purchase those electric bikes. How do they solve it? They lease to own and they use the mobile wallets to actually repay or take money, you could say, from the drivers to make sure they don't default because they're a private company, so they need to make a profit. And what that does is it, in, 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 it puts discipline into the ridership because they're able to actually work the number of days to earn a living and also repay the loan and eventually own the bike. So I think this is a kernel of a solution, but why does it work in the case of Lomi? Because the government, and this is coming to Paul's example, invested in an industrial park that brought in 100% private financing to get value out of the cotton value chain. So you have all these bikes now able to carry cargo to go to the industrial park to leverage the port of Lome to export. And I think this sort of integrated approach to different forms of infrastructure with commerce as the driver could really be a solution because all the people you see there, they're trading something mm -hmm. in that photo. They're bringing vegetables to be sold. They're buying things. So it, there's a lot of trade happening there. And if you can link the, the trade solution to the carb decarbonization solution, I think the financing unlocks itself. But there's a very important role for government because the government can pave the way. by And this is how the United States was developed. When the early investments were made, for instance, for railways, there were private investments. And the private investors were given years of monopoly in order to be able to operate profitably. What we've forgotten a little bit about that, because I agree, we've gone for competitive markets, etc. But we've forgotten that for public goods, such monopoly rights could actually help unlock private financing. And we need to relook at our economics to get the right financing. But we have a question online. Oh, we have a question online. I, I'm going to pause the question online. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, and pause the questions for now, because I need to hit the coffee break. 
Okay. So I'm going to hit the coffee break. Thank the speakers on the stage. Gentlemen behind the microphone, thank you for standing up for a whole 10 minutes. And I'm going to invite you to come to the side of the stage, speak to our speakers one on one, have a great conversation with them as we head into the coffee break. I also want to send you out, if you're in this space, to the knowledge exhibition in the atrium. Let me tell you what will be there. Alcohol simulation goggles. It's exactly what it sounds like. You put the goggles on and you will feel drunk, but you don't have to drink anything. I will race you to the atrium to try those goggles on. Also in the atrium in the knowledge exhibition area, delivery robots. What is the future of robots taking goods and produce around the world? You can see that. And if you can brace the chilly DC air, just outside, we have an electric shuttle. You can get on that, have a look around that. So we can practice transforming transportation even during the coffee break. But for now, let's thank very loudly the speakers of Plenary One. Thank you. <laughs>